All right. Yeah. So I wanted to just kind of walk through a few things, you know, have a conversation related to uh, pride and um, and and continuity of purpose. And, and the reason being what brings this into my mind so clearly is is where we are in 2023, right? Where pride seems to be a, a product that we purchase, right? At Piggly Wiggly or your local pharmacy, where our pride is rooted in those things that we can buy or um, our manhood is rooted in those things that we can buy, that we have. We purchase them from a car dealership or Ikea, right? Or a realtor. And these things demand pride for us, right? Or, 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 or they demand respect from the world. We, we expect that the world respects us because of the things that we have and the things that we can buy. And that validates us today. And that's our source of pride. But I suggest and have suggested, but that, that that's false pride, right? That's not real pride. You can't be proud of things. You can't be proud that, you know, white supremacy pays you well and you're able to live well and comfortably under it. That's not a real source of pride, right? It's not a real source of manhood to be predicated upon the things that you can buy and the things that you can afford. That's not true, right? That's not true manhood. That's not true pride. True pride, true manhood comes from those things that you do, right? What you stand for, the continuity of purpose. These things are the source of true pride, right? And so what I wanted to do is on this uh, Black History Month, what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of share uh, some of the things that give me a sense of pride, right? Some of those things that I'm proud of, right? And, and why they matter to me. So I'm going to go ahead and share out a, a statistic surrounding us in America, right? And kind of where we have come from. And this, I think, is an important level set for a number of different reasons, right? It, today, we hear a common battle cry for reparations. And what happens in those conversations about reparations is we actually forget that we're talking about human beings. We actually forget that we're talking about our families, right? And that these were people, these were actual people. And in our thirst to try to gain compensation and our thirst for the dollars that they printed on April 2nd, 1792, we allow ourselves to be dragged into conversations that do not honor the lives of the people, right? These are people, human beings we're talking about. And we allow ourselves to sully their memory, to sully their sacrifices, and to sully their efforts in their lives and the circumstances that they lived under, right? We do this on a regular basis. And I find myself in conversation with, you know, these different groups, you know what I'm saying, like the FBA and the ADOS, and, and I hear them and I asked them you know what, what was your what was your family's name right who who was it and if the only thing that you're interested in is in reparations and you don't have any plan after that for a uh, brother we've got to we, we need to not distance each other from each other we need to get closer so that we can speak and I can I can share with you I know what that next step looks like, right? We, we have to define a primary goal in order to ever be able to hit that target, right? You will never hit a target that you're not aiming at. So um, it, from my perspective, it's important to do a level set and to take a little bit of a walk through my own personal history, right? And I, fought, I, I found this graphic quite interesting, right? And, and why I find it interesting is in 
from 1790 to 1860, we're looking at the total population of the United States of America growing from 3 million to 31 million, right? In that same time, we look at what they call African-American. Um, I should have, I should have, yeah, can I? Yeah, I don't know if I got an annotate tool where I can cross that out. I probably do. Um, but, and we can see that population growing over time. The percentage of the total population, the number of them that were made into slaves, and the percentage of us that were slaves in America, 92%. Very few were not. So the history that I'm about to go through in 1860, 89% were slaves, right? Or slaves, what they call. Um, and what we see is this number exploded based on breeding, right? This number increased. You, you have to, so the devil's in the details. What you're not seeing in these statistics is how many people were killed, how many children were born and discarded, how many people were uh, like, what you're not seeing is the real details surrounding this population, right? And it the, uh, the other part of that story is you have to remember when they go from 3 million to 31 million, it's because they've invited every other group of people into the United States of America, all of them, Lithuanians, Hungarians, Eastern Europeans, Polish, Everyone was invited. All of those Europeans were invited to come into America and help them crush the native on this continent and take it in full so that it could never be given back and further build this white supremacy machine for them. So their numbers swelled while ours grew moderately over time. And beyond that, the percentage of us that were enslaved equals basically all of us, all of our families, right? Well, I spoke to pride, right? And continuity um, and manhood and these things. Well, so I'm gonna just walk you through a little bit of a story, right? And so my great, my third generation great grandfather, London Addis was 15 years old when he fought in the Revolutionary War, right? We fought in, he fought in the Revolutionary War. And when it, he was a slave to a reverend by the name of Ren, Reverend Lyons in uh, Machias, Maine. And Reverend Lyons signed him up to fight for him. And when the fighting was over, London was ordered back into slavery. He was 15 years old when he first fought. He was ordered back into slavery. He uh, purchased his slavery from money that he earned in fighting. Okay. Now, then, once he purchased his freedom, he went down to Winthrop, Massachusetts. He re-enlisted on a sailing sloop. He earned money, went back up to Machias, Maine, where he was from. Right. This is 1775. Um, and he opened up two businesses, um, a shipping and a lumber business. And he also bought land and named it after himself. Now, the name Addis is likely because he had known of Crispus Attucks. It's not far, Maine to Boston. He had heard of and known Crispus Attucks. And when um, people became free. When they became free men, when they bought their freedom, they had the opportunity to rename themselves. And so what he likely did was choose a name Addis. It wasn't Attics, so he didn't make a connection, but it was close so that it would be recognizable. And this is my thinking as it relates to why he chose the name Addis. His actual name was unknown. His parents were in the New Jersey uh, plantation owners uh, the famous Lions slave owners in New Jersey. That's where his parents were. So we don't, I don't know their last names, right? And so he didn't take a name, he chose one, right? And so London 
earned the money, started these businesses, and he uh, opened, uh, sorry, he purchased land, uh, four acres, I think it was, and he named it Addisville, right? Addisville. It lasted from the American Revolution until 1966, one of the oldest existing African settlements in America, right? Um, and so he named this Addisville. He opened up a school in a cemetery there. And they ran a stop on the Underground Railroad right there in Addisville. Right? An amazing dude. Um, he did he did some amazing things. What is interesting that is that he went and he fought for a freedom that was denied him. And he had to purchase. Right. And he did, in fact, purchase his freedom. And he went on to do things to um, to uh, uh, assist that community that are of great note. Right. With the while the Revolutionary War was going on, the British ships were in the Machias Harbor and they couldn't get goods in and out. They couldn't get back and forth to Boston. Right. So people were dying. They didn't, they couldn't have salt. Salt was the number one thing that was actually about to cause it to be a cemetery up there. Salt. I, I had, at, at one point in my life, I didn't understand how very important salt was to the human physiology. But because they couldn't get salt, they was about to die up there in Machias, Maine. London was the only one that could take a boat, get past those revolutionary warships down into Boston and get back up with salt and supplies. And he kept that whole area alive. Probably, you know, if I could go back and whisper in his ear, we'd have that land right now. <laughs> so that was London. He began that. His son, John Edward Addis, fought in the War of 1812 when he was 15 years old, right? When he was 15 years old. And again, his father fought in the Revolutionary War when he was 15 years old. Okay. Now, they offered him, uh, I think it was London or John, they offered him the ability or the opportunity to sit on the very first July 4th float up there in Maine. Uh, this, was the, this is the first, right? Um, and they offered him the right, and, or the opportunity. And he said, nah, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't want my black face up there with you. So now nah, you go and do your thing. I'm good. Right. And so I illustrate these two um, of my family members to speak to the fact that they, there was no part of them that thought they was American. There was no part of them. Right. America to that point still didn't even recognize their humanity. Right. There, there was no part of them that believed they were a part of this because it never claimed them, right? We'll continue forward. My great, great grandfather, Alexander Benders at the age of 47 fought the civil war, okay? His son, Alexander Benders fought in the same war coming out of New York, right? when he was 25 years old okay so they fought in the war together so now we have the revolutionary war we have the war of 1812 we've got the civil war i've got my grandfather who fought in world war one my i'm not sure what his relation is uh, but he fought in world war one my father fought in World War II. Now, another interesting element here is that two of my grandfathers fought in both World War I and World War II. They were 24 when World War I broke out and they were drafted, and they were 48 when World War II broke out, and they went and fought again. Both World Wars, two grandfathers, both fought. I illustrate these things to say that our past had our men fighting. Not, not, it's not, uh, it's, on the one hand, it was fighting for this country, right? 
and, and fighting for their freedom. But the thinking of these men was, if I fight to get you free, well, then that's going to, you're going to necessarily turn and you're going to free me. I'm going to be free too, right? This is our freedom, right? And when that fighting was over, it became very clear we wouldn't talk about our freedom. This was your freedom. And, and freedom for you was continually deferred. And it was deferred person after person after person after person going all the way back to the Revolutionary War, right? And so then I'm going to step forward and, and go speak to, again, pride. So this is my grandfather, Malcolm Benders, right? He's one of three Black PhDs in the United States of America in the 1930s. You think about who was alive in the 1930s, right? And he is one of three Black PhDs in America, right? So when I speak pride, I'm speaking about a pride in the indomitable spirit of my people, right? I'm speaking about a pride that caused them to always act, to do, to build, to fight, to try, to change their circumstances. That's pride, right? That's real pride when you determine for yourself that nobody is going to save you. Nobody's going to do it for you. This is pride, right? Pride is not what you can buy. Pride is not what you can wear. Pride is not the size of the house that you have or how much money that you can spend or make from white people. That is not a source of true pride. True pride comes from continuity of purpose. I've just demonstrated centuries of my family and 100% of them looking to get free. There was one single and common word on their lips, not rhetoric, not rinse and repeat talk. No, free was the one thing in common between them all. Today, we, we don't, it doesn't seem to be what we want any longer. We are satisfied with monuments and and pomp and circumstance and a month to celebrate our history and a day and all of this d and i right diversity and inclusion and all of this talk right all of this but it waters down what it was that each and every single living human man actually wanted right actually wanted. They didn't want to find comfort under these people. They wanted to be free. They wanted to be free. And so I quickly put this together and wanted to share these images um, just to kind of illustrate and, and let it be seen and let it be known, you know, globally when you start to think about the history of us in America, Africans in America, put some respect on our name because you will not find any Irishman, you will not find an Italian, a Lithuanian, a Hungarian, you will not find any of these immigrants that have spent the amount of blood that we have spent right here, none. Everything that you enjoy in this country was paid for. There was a cost, right? Everything that you, uh, you come and call this the greatest country in the world and enjoy, you're coming for, was paid for in blood. It was paid for in my blood. And I just illustrated that. It was paid for in my blood. So what I would really like to do is, is stop the rhetoric on all sides, right? Whether or not you call yourself FBA, I, I'm going to tell you, man. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to pull punches, man. I'm going to say it real, real clear, right? Shut the fuck up, man. Shut the fuck up for a minute, right? Listen, okay? My African brothers that are uh, attacking back 
shut the fuck up for a minute, okay? There is one group that has a vested interest and in you're bumping your gums back and forth and attacking each other and leaving them completely safe and blameless and turning a profit on your dumb shit, right? Turning a profit on your inability to define pride, your inability to define focus, direction, continuity, your inability to be able to define these things is valuable and profitable for another man. Your inability to define what pride really is, your inability to define what manhood really is, is very, very valuable, right? And so I'm going to suggest all of the back and forth and rinse and repeat and the talking points, right, that are irrelevant, that mean nothing, should be suppressed. You should, you should suppress that. Don't stop acting like little kids in the sandbox going back and forth. You're the same damn people, right? You're the same damn people. We have a common problem and a common solution, right? I simply wanted to put this out for all of those groups to recognize. While you might maybe know of what it is that you contributed to a given country, I know, I dictated, I showed you what mine did. My blood is in absolutely every. So if you come here, come shy, quiet, and unassuming, you say, thank you, right? You say, thank you to a man. And then we begin to sit down and plan. But again, I'm going to tell you, take that bass out your voice talking to me, right? Mine, mine paid for this in blood. Huh? I, my intent is to be free, and I cannot be free while being dependent on white people. That, uh, that, that has nothing to do with, so I don't need to go yell and scream at white people. I did that once upon a time in my life. I was that guy. You know what I'm saying? Standing in Harvard Square on a soapbox, screaming at white people about what they did. I, yeah, I did that, right? But there comes a point where responsibility comes relevant, right? What can they do? What can that white man do, right? If, if I get my point across to him, what does that do? At the end of the day, I'm still dependent. Ain't nobody whipping me and forcing me to take his water, his food, use his supply chains, buy his cars, buy his real estate, pay for his insurance, pay for his, his uh, funeral plots, pay for my bread. Nobody's making me do that, right? I'm submitting to that. And as long as you're submitting to that, shut the fuck up, right? If, if you don't like the security, you don't like the police shooting you in the street, then do your fucking own or shut up, right? You don't like the food choices that you have, make your own or shut up. You don't like the quality of the water that is being provided to you, get your own or shut up. So I don't have nothing to say to them. What would I, what I got to say to them, right? What can they give me? What can they do that will change my circumstances? They can do nothing. And there's nothing for me to say. The, there is nothing for me to say against my African brothers. They didn't do this to me right? There's nothing for me to say against the Chinese people. They didn't do this to me, right? There's nothing. I don't have animosity at, but at, at anyone. I don't have animosity, right? I don't, I'm not angry about history. I recognize history. I appreciate history. I use history, but it doesn't, I, there is no emotional connection for me. I recognize what my family did and what their intent was, what their goals were, what was their motivators. I recognize those things and I take the continuity of purpose and I push forward, right? That's me, right? I'm pushing forward the intent of my family. And I guess my suggestion is that you, rather than talking about your ancestors all the time and talking about and sounding like you respect them, you actually begin to act as if you did, right? Act as if you did and actually learn about them. Stop talking so fucking much. Learn who they were. Learn what their motivations were. Learn what their purpose was that you might fill that as opposed to what the media tells you is important, as opposed to the rinse and repeat talking points, as opposed to the debates and, and arguing and defending yourself and, and on social media looking weak, looking real fucking weak.
right? As opposed to doing all that, learn who your family were. Learn what true pride is. Learn continuity of purpose. Learn what manhood looked like and reclaim those things for yourself. This is what I suggest, all right? So again, I didn't want to take too much time. I do want to say pump your brakes. Watch who you're talking about. <laughs> Watch who you're talking to. <laughs>